What is going on guys? Thanks for watching as always. Um, in this episode we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, usually we make wooden lures like stick baits, poppers, diving poppers, swim baits, crank baits. Um, this time we're actually going to make jigs uh, for species like uh, dock tooth tuna, uh, amberjack, yellowtail kingfish or yellowtail as you call it here in the US, wide variety of uh, other species because uh, they're quite versatile lures. Um, because I've had a lot of requests of uh, people that watch my stick bait making videos um, if I could do a video on making jigs and it does kind of make sense because uh, jigging and popper fishing or fishing with stick baits kind of go hand in hand together a lot of destinations or locations all around the world where that type of fishing can be done uh, you can also do uh, some good jigging for uh, a wide variety of other species so uh, made sense to do a video like this. I did have to kind of dig into some uh, uh, information on how to do it but we kind of got started from scratch and uh, we did make a couple of errors in the process which I will tell you about so you don't have to make them and uh, kind of go from there. Now uh, I'm not going to beat around the bush my favorite jig to use uh, and I might be a little bit biased because uh, I've used this jig very often but we've had great results with it. The, my favorite jig is called the uh, uh, Andaman jig. It's made by a brand called Fisherman, a uh, Japanese brand. Um, very, very good jig and the only one that I've got left is this particular model right here. Now as you can see it's completely stripped of the paint and foil and coating. Uh, for good reason, it's, been, it's caught a lot of fish and uh, there was only a couple of pieces of foil hanging on to their life on the, on the lead body. So I decided to completely strip it and use it as a master for uh, a mold and in that mold we can obviously can make our own uh, jigs. Now this is the smallest model I believe I think this one's 130 grams off the top of my head. Um, we want to make them bigger as well which is what we'll be doing. Now I've already made these jigs even though I'm doing the intro I'm kind of running you through uh, what, what I've already done before I show you the entire process. Uh, this is one of the wooden models that we've made to create a master. Uh, this is the master that we've created for the mold. Um, obviously a bigger version and kind of similar in design, slightly different, but that's fine. Um, and it allows us to make a whole bunch of jigs and I've just gotten started, but um, we'll do everything from, well, let's see what we got here. That's one, two, three, that one, do like multiple color ones. This one right here is a good one. So this is one of the jigs that I made with the, with by basically copying the original uh, fisherman Andaman jig. Um, just to give you an idea what we're, what we're making. Uh, that's just come off a mold that originally was mastered with uh, this one right here. It's uh, roughly about same size, same weight. Probably do the same thing in the water. Uh, and then we'll be making uh, some bigger jigs there we go. With our own master and our own sort of design. But it's kind of similar to the uh, Fisherman Enderman simply because we just had really good results with them. Now, you might think, oh, these are jigs, don't worry about them. I can just buy them and uh, kind of go from there. But let me just run you through uh, a bunch of numbers here. These jigs are not cheap, especially the, the Enderman jig. Quite an expensive jig. Um, I've got it pulled up here on the website and I'll show you in a bit. They run, the, the heavier models run up to about, at the very least, 30 US dollars. Uh, that's the cheapest that I've seen them. Um, and the main problem with it is, and maybe with Amberjack you might not lose as many jigs, because the, the ground's not as rough, but with Dr. Tuna fishing, it's not unheard of that you lose 15 jigs in a day. Now you multiply that by 30, 450 bucks worth of jigs per day, yeah, not a happy camper. So, obviously there's enough reason to uh, be making these jigs yourself. In addition to that, um, what you also can't forget is the shipping on the jigs because they're very, very heavy lures and it's gonna cost a fair bit of extra uh, on shipping. So if we can do all of that at home, cut out the shipping, obviously you're gonna have to pay for your luggage, but that's not gonna change. Um, so it's all about reducing cost, still being effective, um, and still being able to, you know, fish with good jigs. So um, let me just show you real quick 
we're looking at here. This is the um, appetitetackle.com website. Uh, I believe this is owned by um, John Cahill from Melbourne in Australia. Correct me if I'm wrong, don't know if you've moved John. Uh, excellent website, great service from what I've heard. Very knowledgeable guy. Uh, as you can see, they do sell the Fisherman Enderman jig, and I will say they're very hard to come by. They're quite a hard to get lure because they're very popular, uh, but they sell for about 50 Australian dollars. Um, that's the uh, 310 gram model, um, which is also probably the most sought after one because they're, they're legendary among dogtooth anglers. Um, but yeah, imagine if you lose about uh, 10 of those a day, there's 500 Australian dollars gone, which equates to about 450, uh, maybe a little bit less, uh, US dollars, so, um, yeah, not a happy camper. So let's see if we uh, can make some of our own. Alrighty, so we'll put this weight aside because that's what we're eventually going to mold, uh, actually make the, the jigs with. Now, I've got a little bit of wood here. Uh, all of this wood we're going to use to eventually design a, a bigger version of this one, uh, at least something similar. Uh, but we'll start off with the original, just to give us a bit of an idea what we might have to look out for. Um, now, we have to take into consideration the entire building process first, and that includes, obviously, the wire, the internal wire. Now, I've got a variety of stainless steel wire here at home. Um, but we're going to have to remember what the shape of that wire is before we start molding because, uh, well, I guess you can do it after the molding too, now I'm thinking about it. Either way, we'll start off with it. Um, I want to make the measurements of where the wire bends, so we're going to have to have a dot right there and a dot right there. Now, since we got those measurements, dot that out pretty good, good deal. What we're gonna do is, I'll grab my Dremel real quick. We've got those dots located. Now I'm just gonna drill a hole in there real quick. It's a little bit dusty, but should be fine. That's one side done. And Alright, that should be fairly exact. I should probably clean this up. Um, so that way, we can insert, see, I don't know. Oh, it might be a bit wide there, but it's okay. We can put two screws in here, in those holes, and we can actually bend the wire around it. That way we've always got the right uh, dimensions of the, the wire size. So that will help us tremendously uh, once we get a couple of wires done. Obviously, uh, before we pour, pour the lead in, we're going to have to put the, the wires that we've made into the mold, uh, and then we can pour the lead over it, uh, and that way the, the wire will be fixed in. So, sounds like a plan. Alrighty, so I just grabbed two screws. These are not even the same size screws, but you'll get the gist. Uh, we can put that in there. Put that in there somewhat all right so now we got a piece of wire here ready to go this is fairly straight as you can see the trick is this is what we should have thought about oh, that works all right here we go that's one bent put that around there pull it a bit Cool beans. All right. Cool. So here's our wire. We've got the bends, the measurement of the bends correct. I'm assuming. Uh, let me tighten this up a little bit with the pliers. I know these are funky looking pliers, but they do the job, I guess. There we go. Cut. 
coat. Flatten these out. Make sure everything is somewhat straight. And this should be pretty damn close, and it sure is. Cool. So this would probably work pretty well in the mold if we, I mean, obviously we've got some flattening here to do. Um, but this looks pretty damn close to it. Super easy. Couple of minutes. Alrighty. So I've got a uh, pretty old tackle box right here. Um, I've been looking into seeing what the simplest way is for me to make the mold. Uh, this has given us a really good option, uh, at least for this jig. Uh, it perfectly fits within one compartment, um, and we've got some natural risers that will prevent the um, pouring material, which is a pouring silicon for the mold. Um, it will prevent it from spilling over into anywhere or leaking out somewhere. If I'm correct, yep, this is all connected so it won't be leaking through uh, what we are going to do is um, fill up this uh, compartment with some clay uh, so that we've got a, um, a bottom of clay um, I mean I guess technically you could use just the bottom by itself the only thing is if the um, silicone is going to pour all the way on the bottom I'm afraid that we might have a hard time pulling it all out so I'd rather just uh, put some clay in there. Actually, the clay will also help with um, locating the, uh, the screws um, to be included in the mold. You'll see what I mean um, as, we, as we go on, but it should be pretty self-explanatory once we get it going. Alrighty, now it's starting to get a little bit messy here, but that's fine, we're still working. Um, let me show you what the material for the mold will be. Let me see. Here we go. Alrighty, so this is some stuff that I've used in a previous attempt to make some soft plastic swim baits, which actually turned out okay, um, but not something that I'll be pursuing a whole lot. Um, we've got some leftover, so this is still, stuff is called Alumilite High Strength 2 Base RTV Silicone Mold Making Rubber. Uh, I have poured lead in it before, worked fine, no problem. Uh, the pouring uh, material that we use for uh, soft plastic swim baits gets very, very hot as well, so it holds up to that, uh, no problem. Uh, let me see, this is a 10 to 1 by weight ratio. We've got a scale, you need a, sc a good scale for this stuff, uh, as it says 10, 10 to 1. I'd, I'm going to have a rough guess how much we need for this. Beauty of it is though, if we use too much or the malt turns out like crap, we can snip it up into bits and uh, reuse it. So that's a good thing. It's, uh, as it says, it's uh, two component silicone. So let me see. This is the catalyst. So this is the one that you use and 10 for this. So let's uh, do some guesstimating see how much we got. Uh, obviously this is going to be a very small component so I'm just going to mix up a cup of this stuff, see how much it weighs without the cup obviously um, and then we'll just add a tenth of uh, the weight in the catalyst. Should be pretty straightforward. Alrighty guys so we've got our scale right here Oh, turn it on. That's zero. I oh, need to have it re zeroed. So that's what? Um, that's zero. Cool. So we're just gonna have a guess of how much we're going to need. So let's have a look. I was making 160 grams. Close enough. Well, clearly, because it says 160. Cool. Anyway, put that aside. 
So 10% is 16 grams, so we'd be looking at a total of uh, 176 grams. Not sure if you're supposed to shake it, but I am, just in case. What does it say? Um, yep. Cool, so I just remembered that whenever this turns a universal pink color, we're ready to pour the mold. Alrighty. 176 is what we said. There we go. 176. Cool. That's that done. And for a lack of other materials, I'm just going to stir with a pen. And you have to mix very thoroughly. Make sure you scrape the bottom very well. Um, scrape the sides very well. You'll see already it's going to turn a little bit of pink but we haven't mixed it properly yet, so. We wanna make sure that the whole thing turns a pretty bright pink from what I remember. But we should be all right. All right, sorry about that, guys. I thought the camera was already rolling. It wasn't. So we've already started pouring here. Um, as I said, one thing I like doing is make sure that there's a really thin stream of uh, silicone going over at first and what that helps do is prevent bubbles from building up onto the mold. Obviously we want to have as smooth of a cast as possible. Now it's not too big of a problem if there are some bubbles with this pour because with lead we can just sand it down in contrast to what I usually use this stuff for which is uh, making molds for soft plastics. But it's a good practice anyway. So we'll just pour some down here and I will turn the mold a little bit so that the silicone can get under the, the jig. Um, that'll be quite helpful I'm assuming. Cool. Alrighty, so a little bit further. Uh, I busted, busted a couple of bubbles but there might still be some in there. Yeah, I can still see some. Let me see if I can... Sometimes that works pretty well. Alright, anyway, we'll carefully pour the, the rest of the mix. Hopefully it will cover up all the important bits. Alrighty, so um, we're one day later. Um, I got the mold done and I will cut it up just right now so we can pop the. Oops. Yes. Um, so we can pop it out of mold. Done deal. Now I'll have to trim it a little bit. But as you can see... Oh, that looks hot. <laughs> this looks uh, not like what it should look like, but... Uh, don't let your mind wander off, but yeah, either way, that mold is uh, done. Oh, God. So, we'll trim the edges a little bit, um, and then that way, we've got a... Yeah, although it doesn't seem to be, what I'm afraid of with the mold is that the um, residue or the, the stuff that's overhanging here is going to come down a little bit and it's going to affect our mold. But 
it doesn't look like it will. So maybe we're in luck. Uh, I will trim this part though. Obviously we need to have a, a good clean section where we can pour through. So I won't, doesn't seem like I have to cut too much. But um, let's see if I can trim some here. That looks fairly clean. I mean there will be some inaccuracies I guess but since it's lead it's and it's all one solid weight it's going to be pretty easy to, to work with that you know obviously if, if you'd mold a stick bait and it'd be slightly off then you you may have to start all over again whereas this is pretty simple to work with also doesn't really have to be exact in my opinion anyway so uh, yeah I guess the only thing that's left to do is uh, to try and pour now we do have that wire ready so let's see if that would work. As you can see, the wire's in there. Um, all it really requires is uh, to start pouring, see how it turns out, so it should be pretty good. Important, always wear protective gear when working with lead. Always make sure you work in a well ventilated area. Never cool hot lead with water. Alrighty, so in this section you'll see me um, with the melting pot, there's already some lead that has been uh, melted over a stove. Um, here you just see me pour it in the mold. Now, the whole construction that I've got there, I couldn't find anything to put underneath the mold uh, to prevent the, the lead from running onto the, uh, the kitchen table. Um, so I just used the first thing I could grab. Uh, so don't pay too much attention to that. Uh, that's basically how an open mold pour is done. It's super quick, very easy to do, um, although it might take a little bit of practice. Uh, sometimes the lead uh, cools down quick, more quickly than you can pour the mold full with the lead, so that might make it a little bit more tricky. Alrighty, so we've made a couple of jigs and trust me when I say that these are definitely not the greatest looking jigs in the world so I don't want you to be discouraged if your pores don't turn out great immediately. Uh, mine definitely didn't. Uh, this is one of the first pores that I uh, made. As you can see there's a bunch of like really uneven sections. Uh, this is the top section right here. I will say this is one that I poured with not enough lead being uh, melted so I didn't have enough material to work with but I'm still going to go with it because I don't really care and that gives me an opportunity to show you that even with a crappy looking jig we can still make something that works perfectly uh, good. Uh, this is one of the better ones as you can see looks a lot more uh, even there is some bubbles in there but it's a much better looking jig. Uh, I did do some sanding, just to, just so you know. Um, here's another one that I made. I filled up the holes here with some, uh, I don't know what I used, uh, super glue and sawdust, but yeah, it's uh, not bad, but what I'm really looking for is that I've got the, the shape right now. This was the original, um, as you can see, basically everything came back in it, um, and on the other side as well. So, I mean, you gotta take into consideration that this is the rough side because this is the open side from pouring, so it doesn't really get a shape uh, if there's a cut like here in there. Uh, but you can send that in there. Uh, what I will say is if you do send lead, make sure you wear appropriate breathing protection, which uh, in this day and age everyone should have with the fireside break and stuff. Um, but um, make sure that you wear appropriate protection because you don't want to breathe that lead dust in. So be careful with that. Um, Another thing I'll point out, obviously it's not all even, uh, but at the end of this we're going to epoxy it. So that will create some spacing uh, between it. Beauty of my uh, situation is that I've got a dryer that rotates fairly quickly, which means that a very limited amount of epoxy will actually drop off the lure that I'm drying, uh, which means I'm gonna have a thicker epoxy coat, which basically will even out everything. Now, if you really badly wanted to fill up these holes, which you can, uh, I would probably recommend a uh, epoxy coat before foiling it, but we're going to foil it regardless because I don't really care to be honest. Um, it's just a jig, so see how we go. We'll do the same thing as what we usually do. Let me get my um, knife. So I'm just using a straight piece of 
uh, cardboard just like I usually would and I'm gonna start creating a sideways cut that is on an angle so we'll start right here and the more time you're willing to take for this the better the result will be as with most things but trick is that you've got a sharp knife that you just want to scratch the foil with you don't want to cut it so ready So here we're speeding up the process a bit. I've done this many, many times in other videos, but I might get some new viewers that still have to show how you can make a nice um, scale pattern on foil. Um, basically all I use is that straight piece of cardboard and a uh, sharp knife, as I stated before. Um, key with this whole thing is to keep the lines as uh, equally as close together as uh, all the other lines that you're making, so you want the spacing out to be um, even and in the same direction so there shouldn't be an angle on line they should always be running parallel that allows you to uh, make a nice diamond cut um, pointing one way uh, from left to right and the other way from right to left crossing it over and uh, yeah you get a pretty decent scale pattern so here you just see me um, apply the foil to the uh, jig now I filled this jig up uh, with some um, epoxy just to even the holes out, it was super easy to do. Um, just to make sure that uh, I could make uh, a good looking jig for very, very cheap with very little effort. Even though uh, initially there were some uh, big holes in the lead due to uh, bubbles building up in the mold. Um, one way to prevent that, uh, at least a little bit, is to preheat your mold in, the, in uh, the oven. Although I would be careful with it. You're better off doing it with a heat gun or something. So, But it might not be completely preventable at all. So after the epoxy coat I'm applying um, some eyes and I'm coloring it with a sharpie. I honestly do not care for color but we want to show you that you can make a decent looking lure for, with uh, very little effort. You don't need a, an airbrush or anything. So if you kind of want a faded color pattern on the side you can just kind of rub it in uh, otherwise you just paint it one color. Pretty simple. Um, you can uh, cover it with uh, nail polish, clear nail polish as well, um, but that's up to you. I prefer epoxy, I've tried both. Uh, clear nail polish might be a bit more uh, easily available. The reason why epoxy is not necessary, but um, epoxy is used in wound lures is that there really is no significant reason to um, seal the, the material off. Now we've also done some engraving on some um, jigs just because we wanted to see um, what we could do in terms of uh, getting a little bit creative. Um, turned out quite well, pretty happy with the end result. Alright guys, so there you have it. I uh, kind of wanted to skip over the, uh, the bigger jig pouring because it basically comes down to the exact same thing as we did with the smaller jig and I don't want to make the video longer than it already is. I know I go into a lot of detail a fair bit but uh, I want to show you some of the mistakes and the things I run into uh, so you don't have to worry or you don't have to make the same mistakes that I did. Um, so that's why it gets a little bit more lengthy but that's the way it is. So at the end of it all we've got some um, big 300 plus gram jigs from the um, one that we made ourselves and then some uh, smaller jigs uh, as a result of uh, the original uh, molding of the uh, original uh, 130 gram fisherman andaman jig so the proof is in the pudding they say now we can't really do a proper test because we don't have a testing facility where we can drop a jig down uh, 300 feet but we do have a pool and we can kind of pull these through the water to uh, see how it swims and then kind of compare it to the ones that we've bought ourselves and if it's remotely similar uh, honestly if they don't swim anything like the original then I still wouldn't be worried because I know these things will catch fish 
regardless. Uh, but just to give me an example. Alrighty, so first off we've got the uh, original Fisherman Enderman jig. Now one thing I will say is we're not fishing this with any hooks on it, so it will be a slightly different action, but we can at least compare the two if we don't put hooks on either of them. Uh, this one kind of, on a straight retrieve, it kind of rolls uh, and darts around. Um, depending on the pace, it either has quite a wide wobble or just a, a slow roll. Sometimes it looks in the video like it's spinning, but I actually slowed down the footage and it's actually not spinning. It actually just wobbles real tight. Um, obviously, it's kind of a hard comparison to make simply because that's not the way that you fish these jigs. You drop these jigs down straight from the boat down to the bottom and um, jig them up. So straight from the bottom up, um, not casting this thing. Well, I guess you could cast it, but that's not what they're intended for. So I am assuming the action is going to be different. Um, you will see that the one that you'll see right now is actually the one that I made so it's kind of like the copy of the Fisherman Enderman jig action is very similar rolls, uh, darts a little bit at the same pace uh, this one's the closest one uh, that looked the most similar to the original so uh, that's the one I tested and yeah very happy uh, with the result definitely uh, Saved me a couple of bucks getting that instead of a brand new Fisherman Enderman jig. So, um, definitely more to come for the future trips. Um, thanks for watching, guys. As always, if you've got any questions, just let me know. Uh, more than happy to answer them. Uh, make sure you take all the safety precautions for uh, making these jigs. And uh, stay safe during these crazy times. Cheers.